welcome everyone. Uh, for best viewing, I suggest you go into my view at the bottom and go into the presentation mode, which is the best. So how are you? How has the week been? If you can look back, it's not really necessary with mindfulness, by the way, you don't have to look back. You don't have to look forward. You can just uh, tell us how you feel right now. So how are you? And Zainab is here. Is it Zainab or Goulet? I'm not sure. Uh, you can unmute yourself, but make sure. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, uh, Sanya, maybe you can write in the chat that they should um, check their mic settings um, and their speaker settings because uh, they may be different. Mm -hmm. And Shilpi's here. Welcome. Glad you made it today. And you can turn on, yes, I should also turn mine on. Uh, turn on your cam if you can, or your circle cam if you wish, or you can go to the top. If you open your cam, it'll open up at the top. If you open your circle cam, it's just a little circle. What students really like, because then they don't have, you don't have to see too much uh, there aren't any privacy issues with the circle cams because you can't see too much. And I think that's what most um, people prefer. So how are you feeling today from one to 10? Just give me a number, any number. I feel nine. Nine. Nine is wonderful. I was going to say seven. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Not the 10 is the nine. best. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a seven. Anyone else? You can tell us your favorite number. That's fine, too. So shout out whenever you're ready about your number and how you're feeling today. As I said before, you got here, some of you. Uh, in mindfulness, we don't look back. We don't look forward. We just try to focus as much as we can on what's going on right now. And there's usually plenty uh, that's going on. Notice I chose a background. Maybe you can tell me why uh, this background might make sense to someone. You mean the waves? Okay, so you see waves. Yeah, anything that you see that you think might mean something to someone yeah, to but you. there aren't so many waves it seems like kind of calm but a little rough and uh, i can notice that the sea and the sky they are kind of aligned almost the same color so they are let's say aligned together maybe somehow do you know what that what could that mean any suggestions from what you've read about mindfulness or how you feel about it. You're right, they are kind of the same. There's no real separation. And you're right about the ripple. There aren't really waves, but it's not calm. Let's put it this way. Undercurrents. Yes? Some undercurrents. Undercurrents, okay. Something's going on underneath it all. Anyone else? Balance, uh, maintaining a balance. Some kind of a balance. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're going to get started. Let me start with a screen sharing and today's presentation. Today we are in week three, and our focus is going to be on three things in week three. Let me share this tab. You can see the week, right? Everybody can see that. Let me know. Just shout out if you can see yes, it. Yes, we can see it. Great. So in week three, we're going to focus on the differences between formal mindfulness and informal mindfulness practice. And 
mindfulness in the classroom, which is something that you've been writing about. And I've been enjoying, I've been learning so much from your responses. And I think you're probably learning about different things from other people's responses. And I think that's what's great about learning together that we can share and we learn when we share, but we also learn when we read other people's posts and uh, viewpoints. So in week three, there are two videos. How can you go from feeling stressed to calm in under 30 seconds? Do you believe it? Phil Wazir. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what we're focusing on. We're going to talk about pausing and to pause 30 seconds is enough. So Paul Brozier shares his simple technique to bring mindfulness to your busy life anytime, anywhere. And this is informal mindfulness. You can um, take a look at that. And there is also, and I'm sure you recognize him, the man who brought mindfulness to the West, John Gabbett Zinn, an American who, by the way, lived in India for many years. Which place in India? Oh, I think I know he was in different places. Um, I'm not sure you can read about him. Yeah. In, you will explore, as I said, uh, and compare formal versus informal mindfulness awareness practice. And here is the presentation. I'm going to open that up. You also have access so you can open it up yourself as well. And I believe everyone can see that. Am I right? Am I wrong? Now you can see it. <laughs> yeah, I have to go through a few tabs. So this is the agenda for today. We're uh, going to look at the reading. There's still some problems. I try to fix the problems with Aminote and go back to what I had last year. So it's kind of um, work for me, but we'll get it. Uh, Aminote annotation discussions on formal versus informal uh, classroom. You'd be choosing activities and working with a Google Doc on how to add your activities. Um, you'll be practicing through live meetings and you'll be creating your own uh, live meeting for a formal mindfulness practice and a reflective practice in the diary. These are the moderators, myself and Sanya, who's here with us from Croatia. You'll read the article and then you'll be creating 10 slide presentation with only images using the tools and uh, that's all there. And I'll take you there after we go through the slides and this presentation. So as you saw in the image, life goes on and the waves, they could be, you know, big waves, they could be small waves or just ripple, but it's still, they still go on and on and on. I don't know if you've ever thought about waves and the fact that they never stop. And that's life. Life goes on. The question is, where are we as life goes on? Are we on autopilot? We talked about that. Or are we part of life and we are there every second of the way? Without control. Now, our heart beats we can't control our heartbeat. I mean, there are some people who can, I heard, but normally we can control our hearts beat. That's life. And our brain generates thoughts and we have no control over the thoughts that come. We can want them to disappear, but they're still going to be there. And if we do something else, if we distract ourselves, we may stop the thoughts from coming, but then they'll come back for some reason and they'll catch us when we least expect. Other people's actions, we can control. We can control our own, but we can control others. So think of the classroom. If you've got a classroom like this, um, 
where the kids notice it's only boys, but girls could do this as well. Um, we can't, what can we do to get students to pay attention and not to do their own thing, or even to notice that we're there in class? Lots of techniques and mindfulness has answers for that. Unexpected events like COVID, which we never expected. Now it's kind of over, we're, we're living with it. It's, COVID's not over, but we are managing to live with it. But it was problematic and we had to adjust to it. We couldn't control anything, it controlled us. So we have no control over any of the events that happen around us. But what we can do is put our mind in neutral gear. Now, how do we do that? In 30 seconds, even less, how do we do that? Any suggestions? How can you put your mind in neutral gear? If you're a driver, that means that the car doesn't move. Or it makes a horrible sound if you try to hit the gas. No answers? You can pause. Ooh, that's a good idea. That's right. And how long does it take to pause? Anyone, how long does it take to just pause? Less than a minute. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. It's, 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 I don't know, a second, um, just to pause. And that's all we need to do is just pause so that we are in a neutral zone just by pausing. Just hit on that button and pause. So easy to do. And if you ask, well, how long should I pause for? Even a second is enough to get your uh, system into neutral zone and for you to refresh and start. And if you do this in class, by the way, I don't know if any of you use this technique of simply looking at the class when they're misbehaving and just pausing. And then you can take a deep breath, of course. What happens to the classroom? Generally, they stop too. It's like they have to mimic. There is a mirroring feature that we have in our brain that when we see someone do something, we tend to mirror them and do the same thing. And that's what happens uh, with mindfulness in the classroom. So we pause, we take a break. And that this is very important to remember. Whenever circumstances, news, the social media, outcomes, health reasons, other people, relationships, thinking, feelings, whenever we face anything that we cannot control, which is most of life, we pause. If it's unbearable or hard, just pause. Don't try to find something else because it'll backfire on you. So the pausing. Pause, to pause like that is part of informal mindfulness. It's a technique. Another one that we mentioned is the body scan. You can sit in your class or you can stand and just feel the ground under you. Feel the floor, the inside of your shoes, your socks. And if you're sitting, feel every part that is touching the chair. Just feel yourself grounded. And you can do the body scan. By the way, I did this uh, with some students and interesting enough, um, most of the ADD, I don't know, I didn't research this, but most of the hyper, the kids that generally were hyper or on medications, um, they wanted to keep standing. I would ask the whole class, let's stand up. When I saw that they were, you know, restless, okay, stand up. Instead of telling them, you know, or instructing them or getting their attention in some other way by clapping your hands or different ways, I would just point my hands up and say, stand up. You know, they saw my hands and they would stand up. Generally, they were shocked. And then I, I told them, okay, let's try to 
feel the ground or put our arms up or, you know, I made them do all kinds of crazy things. Uh, and I told them if their parents said anything, I would say, well, this is just language. It's listening, following instructions. Okay. So it's part of teaching English. So that was never a problem. Uh, some of the um, kids that were, that tended to be restless would prefer to stand. They wanted to keep standing. They enjoyed it. And I was, it always surprised me that those kids were the ones that enjoyed it and wanted to keep standing. And I said, okay, fine, you can stand. And that's what they did until they felt comfortable and they sat down. Um, so the body scan, always connecting to our bodies, especially if we, if we get frustrated or feel strong emotions, if when we're angry or uh, somebody upsets us, um, when we sense negative em emotions, the emotions usually are felt in our bodies. Our bodies are the first places where the emotions go. And that's why we have bad cakes and so on, because uh, something bothered us and it takes uh, different parts of the body, wherever the body is weak, that's where the pain starts. So the body scan really helps deal with um, uncontrollable emotions. So if you feel weak or, or you feel like crying or you were hurt or whatever, just feel the ground and pause and just scan your body. Mindful seeing. We mentioned this last time, look at an object and just look at it with your eyes open. Everything is with your eyes open. Mindful listening. Just listen to the sounds in the classroom, but don't judge them. Just listen. Mindful breathing, pay attention to your breath. And of course, there's a five sense exercise that you can find in the five mindfulness exercises you can do anywhere. And that's what's good about informal mindfulness, that you can do it anywhere. And it's wonderful practice. So all these, it's clickable and the presentations there in week three. Mindfulness awareness practice is a map. We were not born with a map. Animals are born with a map. They know where to find their food. They know where to find shelter. They are better at surviving than we are because, well, there are various reasons for that, but we don't have a map when we're born. We don't know what to do. We have to go through life learning and unlearning and learning and getting wrong information and getting frustrated. So mindfulness awareness practice is a map. We become mindful of actions, whatever we do. If you're sitting right now, pay attention as you hear my voice, don't judge it. And if you judge it, go back to your body. Anything that bothers you or excites you, uh, go back to your body and pay attention to in this case, you're sitting to where the contact of your body to the object, to the chair and pay attention to that or to the floor if you're standing or if you're able to, and you should be able to touch the floor, you may need to adjust your chair, then sense the bottom of your shoes and the contact with the phone, with the floor. When you're eating, we mentioned this last time, uh, when you're eating, eat, just eat. Don't watch television and eat, or don't talk to people and eat unless you go out and you have no choice. But at home, even if you're eating with your family, eat. Um, you know, there's the old saying that our parents used to tell us in the old days that, or they said about their parents that you don't eat, you don't talk when you eat. Okay. And so we forgot about that. And reading, when you read, I think that's not a problem for most of us, but pay attention to the page, not just the words, but to the fact that you're reading. Pay attention to the action, to know that you're reading, to know that you're eating, to know that you're listening, to acknowledge every action know that you're driving. And I told you my story and the dangers of being on autopilot when you're driving. So keep coming back to the car that you're driving, you're running. And this is very 
important for runners and they learn how to do this. Uh, there's mindfulness in sports. It's very popular and important, especially in competitive sports, so that they don't get injured. Because if they don't pay attention to what action, for example, in gymnastics, if they're not there in their bodies, they're going to get hurt. And that's when accidents happen. So you need to be in your body, uh, walking, swimming. Don't just walk to work or drive to work or to wherever you're going shopping. Be there. Swimming also and talking when you're talking. Be aware of your body as you speak. Pay attention means this awareness in mindfulness means that you're paying attention. You're being open to the present. You're not judging because you don't have time to judge because you're paying attention to the action. And when judgment comes, you come back to the action. So if you're eating and you're thinking about what you're going to do after breakfast or after lunch, you come back to the eating and pay attention to the food when thoughts come in because they will come in. You can't get rid of your thoughts, thank goodness, because as long as we're alive, our minds will keep generating thoughts. You're conscious of perception, you're conscious of your surroundings, and this way you'll avoid accidents. Uh, conscious of feelings, conscious of your physical bodies, I said, you're observing, and you're actually stopping time. And you'll sense this when you do uh, formal mindfulness about stopping time. And this becomes a practice. It's a habitual practice. It takes time, but it works. Formal mindfulness is actually practice for informal mindfulness. When you do formal mindfulness, which is sitting, we did it last time, where you sit with your eyes open or closed, it's okay. You can also lie down as long as you don't fall asleep um, because the idea of mindfulness is to wake up, not to feel drowsy. And you pay attention to your breath. Now, these activities, the formal mindfulness is actually the meditation. You asked me last time, is mindfulness meditation? No. Mindfulness is a combination of formal and informal, but actually mindfulness is informal. It's using it all the time, whatever you do. Formal mindfulness is meditation. It's a way for you to become more mindful. It strengthens your brain. And this has been documented with MRI that uh, formal mindfulness strengthens the brain. Uh, 10 minutes is enough to change your brain. So you sit back, your back is straight, but you do not lean. Your back is on its own and you pay attention to your breath in one spot, whether the belly or your chest or somewhere else. It could be under your nostrils or through your mouth. If you prefer to breathe through your mouth, if it's slightly open. And distractions will come and you'll get lots of amazing ideas about how to do things, uh, your next lesson, what you're going to do. Lots of great ideas come and you think, oh my gosh, this great idea. And I'm in the middle of mindfulness. What do I do? Well, you go back to the breath and you'll remember it. No worries. It'll come back. 10 minutes and time it. Time it. Don't just uh, do it, but time it. Today, there are lots of timers on your phone, for example. And if you like, you can do guided mindfulness practice, formal mindfulness practice. There are lots of applications that are free, like Calm. Has anybody heard of Calm on the phone? It's an app that's quite popular. And they have wonderful guided mindfulness um, meditation practice for free. The idea, of course, is to occupy the mind, because if you don't occupy your mind, it'll occupy you. Now, what does it mean to occupy you? It means that thoughts will come in and you'll be bombarded with them. 
with a lot of mindfulness, you'll find that because your mind becomes stronger and is able to pay attention in a better way, and you'll find that your time is used in a better way, you waste less time when you do uh, mindfulness, informal and formal, um, you'll be able to become conscious of your activities and you'll have a purpose. You'll find that you don't have to think of a purpose. You will be the purpose. So listening, mindfulness, reading and sports will become part of your everyday life. And that's what we're doing with formal mindfulness, which is actually meditation. We are strengthening the muscles, our paying attention muscles, the ones that help us focus. And think of a world where we go on automatic pilot. I mean, who wants to live a life like that? I think someone mentioned the fact that uh, she wants to be more present because, you know, time just flies. Time doesn't fly when you practice mindfulness. You find that you all of a sudden have a lot of time then you'll notice that as well. So what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to do guided mindfulness. Let me just make sure that uh, I have the sound on. So get ready. Make sure that you are comfortable wherever you happen uh, to sit. and listen. Okay, I'm clicking on the wrong link. Let me go back here. Tell me if you see this. Can you see it now? Yes, you can, right? Okay, here we go. So establishing yourself now in a sitting posture that embodies wakefulness and dignity, either cross-legged on a suitable cushion and mat on the floor, or on a meditation bench or a straight back chair, allowing your head and neck to be balanced on your shoulders and the whole of the torso to be erect but not stiff, placing your hands on your knees or together in your lap in a comfortable way, and allowing your shoulders to be relaxed and dropped. Letting your pelvis provide a stable base to support your upper body, aware of the sensations of contact with the cushion or the chair. In other words, as best you can, sitting with the qualities of a mountain, fully present in the body, stable, grounded, and with an element of uplift to the posture itself. And when you're ready, becoming aware of the fact that you're breathing, bringing your attention to the belly as it expands with the in-breath and deflates with the out-breath, or to the passage of air in and out of the nostrils, or anywhere else that the breath sensations are accessible and vivid for you, and just feeling the breath coming into the body and leaving the body. Riding on the waves of the breath sensations with your full attention as best you can, moment by moment by moment, and breath by breath by breath as we sit here. In touch as best you can be with the full duration of each breath coming into the body and the full duration of each breath leaving the body. Feeling the breath sensations as they flux and change moment by moment by moment.
It's best if you can stay with the breath at a particular location in the body for an entire practice period. So if you start with the belly or with the nostrils, then the suggestion is to stay with the breath sensations in that region rather than to jump around. In that way, we are cultivating a greater intimacy and familiarity with the breath and a greater stability of attention. So just letting each breath come and go of its own accord, feeling the sensations of the breath moving in and out, moment by moment by moment. Of course, you may rapidly discover that it's not so easy to keep your attention on the breath. It doesn't take long to realize that just as in the body scan, the mind has a life of its own and will invariably take off into the past or the future, planning or worrying, liking or disliking, daydreaming or reverie, impatience or boredom, or even sleepiness. This is totally normal and not a problem at all. When you notice that your mind is no longer on the breath, then noticing what is on your mind in that moment, and then gently letting go of whatever it is, which doesn't mean pushing it away, but just recognizing it and letting it be as we escort our attention back to the belly or to the nostrils, back to this breath, whether it's an in-breath or an out-breath. And once again, re-establishing the breathing center stage in the field of awareness. And if the mind wanders away from the breath a hundred times, as it surely will, each and every time when we become aware that it is someplace else, we gently and patiently note what is on our mind in this moment, whatever it is, perhaps even making a light mental note, such as thinking, thinking, or planning, planning, or worrying, worrying, and without being harsh or critical or judging of ourselves, we simply recognize what is arising for what it is and let it be as we come back to feeling this breath in this moment and begin again and again and again, each time for the first time, each moment, the only moment, since our lives are unfolding here and now and only here and now, no matter what our thoughts are telling us. Since it's in the nature of the mind to wander, it's not that you are failing at meditation if your mind doesn't stay on the breath. It's that you're discovering something exceedingly important about the nature of the mind itself. And that is that it waves, just as the ocean waves. So it's never a matter of putting a stop to it, trying to shut off your thinking or make your mind go blank but rather familiarizing yourself with the nature and the ways of your own mind and cultivating a deeper intimacy with it through gentle observation, grounded in an awareness that is bigger than thinking and wiser than thinking and usually kinder than thinking, an awareness that grows out of our bringing the mind back to the breath gently but firmly over and over and over again, allowing each in-breath to be a new beginning and each out breath a complete letting go.
So sitting here now, mountain-like, fully awake, with a light touch, resting in awareness, not forcing anything, but as best we can, being fully in touch moment by moment with the breath as it comes into the body and as it leaves the body and coming back over and over again when we lose touch with it momentarily as we stay here sitting. Soon you will hear the sound of a bell to signal the end of this segment of the sitting meditation practice. If you are extending your practice today to include one or both of the following tracks that expand the sitting practice, then just continuing right through the bell with a seamless continuity of moment to moment awareness. Otherwise, please use the sound of the bell to mindfully bring this period of formal practice to a close. That was formal mindfulness. Thank you. Whatever thoughts came, like maybe you were bored, maybe you were impatient, uh, maybe you thought this isn't the right time, what am I doing here? Whatever thoughts went through your head, through your mind, are very important. It's important to notice them, not to wish them away, as John mentioned, but to pay attention to them and come back to the breath. That's the practice, that's the exercise of uh, doing mindfulness, formal mindfulness practice. There's also a timer here, which is five minutes for those who want to use it when they go over the uh, presentation, that's possible. This is what mindfulness does. It actually gives us a larger view of whatever is out there. We see more and we see things with clarity. And that's what you'll find with practice that you start seeing things that perhaps you had not noticed before because we're paying attention. So obviously we're seeing a lot more. Mindfulness in the classroom. Now I'd like to just get a, an idea of those that are here. Uh, what age groups do you teach? Do you teach very young learners, young learners, uh, junior high, high school or adults? If you could just let me know, just shout out, since I'm not looking at the chat. Just unmute your mic. 
I have very okay. young learners and some older ones. So how I'll say old are the very young ones? How young? young? Around seven, eight. And the older ones are 12 and 13 years old. Okay, perfect. So this would take a look at this for young learners, for very young learners. Uh, what they do is they lie down on a mat. I don't know if you're in your school or an other school, if it's possible to lie down, but it is possible to bring a, um, a mat and then maybe take turns or have everyone bring their own mats. You can decide that perhaps with their parents or with the school. You can also do this in the gym, which is also a solution uh, because in the gym, you probably have mats so that they can lie down on the mats. I don't know if that's a possibility. But if you've got young children, this is perfect. You can do this at home as well, or grandchildren, whatever, uh, young people, very young people. So there's a video here. I'm not going to show it, but it has five excellent exercises for young, very young learners. This one is uh, for mindful teachers. And, and what they say is that um, mindful teachers have mindful students. And the reason is that it passes on, you know, there, there's a, a psychological effect that we all have. Uh, I think monkeys also have it, but humans have it where we mirror. We uh, when we see someone doing something, we, we tend to do the same thing. We mirror whether we like it or not. We tend to mirror one another uh, when someone's in a bad mood. It'll sometimes it affects us because we're mirroring whatever they're feeling. Uh, you can start paying attention to mirroring. If you're interested in that, you can also read about it, the mirroring effect. So teachers that are mindful in the classroom will find that it's a lot easier to get students to be mindful. Uh, there's something about uh, the mirroring and students pick up on this. Um, this is how you can explain mindfulness to children. We discussed this. How do you explain it to children? How do you explain it to parents? I think it's easier for children to explain it to their parents. But uh, this video has uh, a very interesting approach and approaches. There are a few ideas here that you can find this video about what is mindfulness and how to do it uh, in the classroom with uh, young learners. Not very, but young. Uh, mindfulness practice brings the following skills into play in the classroom. Compassion. When um, you practice mindfulness, when your students practice mindfulness, they become more compassionate to each other. It's just one of the, um, I guess, the ripple effects of uh, mindfulness. This has been documented. We don't know how it works. Uh, if you're interested, lots of research out there on how compassion is built through mindfulness. And these are the skills, care. There's more caring attitude from the teacher as well as from the students. Communication is a lot more effective. There's collaboration, a sense of wanting to help one another. There's some goodness comes out of uh, doing mindfulness practice. People become a better version of themselves, maybe because of the pause. You know, learning to pause really helps in uh, seeing the other person's perspective sometimes. And of course, critical thinking and creativity as well. The distracted mind, we talked about the monkey mind last time. I hope you enjoyed the videos on that. Um, we go through a lot of chaotic moments in our lives. There's chaos um, inside of us and outside of us just like with the ripple, we can't really control it when we can't really see things. Everything seems to be foggy um, in our heads. And we often say that my, I've got a brain fog. You know, people mention this a lot during COVID, but the brain fog um, is something that you'll hear people talking about. I can't, I can't think right now. What does it mean? So um, the distracted mind becomes a lot clearer and there is a sense of order. It doesn't mean that there is order, but we can kind of live with it and, and, and look at it. And by looking at disorder, 
as it is for what it is and not trying to control it, it takes the stress away and we find better ways to deal with it. Our default mode is um, automatic pilot. That's what we do. And so we often are not aware of what's happening. Through mindfulness, we become aware. We don't just have random thoughts. Our thoughts are more, uh, con not controlled because we don't control our thoughts, but we find that the, um, the thoughts that we don't appreciate that much, that we don't give them a lot of attention. We, we pay attention to more relevant things that can help us and less attention to what pulls us down. And that's one of the problems is that we, on our autopilot, we tend to pay attention to thoughts that cause us harm. So we don't do that. We just pay attention to them, but we don't make too much of them. And we're able to focus on other things. We don't feel the need for control and we're not mindless. We are mindful and we're not on automatic pilot. We are conscious and that's wonderful. I've been using uh, insight on my phone for free. It's an app both for Google and for the iPhone. I use it to time myself, but it also has other things. But if you go into it, you'll find if you have questions about it, I can help you where you can go in and get a bell, whichever bell you want. You can decide on the time. If it's two minutes, put it for two minutes. If it's for um, five, five, whatever it is, um, you put the timer. It starts off with a bell of your choice, whatever instrument you decide. You can also have your own music if you like to start it off. That's possible. And, and, and then it'll end with the same sound. So inside has really helped me. I also connect it to my Apple uh, watch or to my iPhone so that I can see how I'm doing and not miss a day. This is one way that I motivated myself uh, to do this by um, having some kind of a tracking system. And this is highly recommended. It's been researched that when you have um, a tracking system, somewhere where your progress is tracked like i use um i'm on the iphone so i use health health has this but i'm sure androids have it too some kind of a tracking system there are a lot out there we can discuss that in the support forms if you like people who have some suggestions of apps to track the the progress and then you you, you have a sense of accomplishment and you don't miss a day because you don't want to see that X on that day or an empty, uh, a blank space for the day that you missed. So this is one way of encouraging us to uh, practice because it has to be done every day. You've talked about uh, developing new habits and making changes. It's not easy. Uh, you mentioned fog, most of you, because you had to watch a video by fog. There's also a book called Tiny Habits by BJ Fogg. I have an extra book here that I would love to share with someone. But um, if you're interested and you're willing uh, to pay for I would give the book for free if you're willing to pay for the uh, expenses of sending it. Uh, changing habits that you can watch. There's also an interesting uh, video by Matt Cutts, I don't know if I mentioned it, who suggested doing something different for 30 days. So do mindfulness for 30 days. No more, just 30 days, uh, five minutes a day or two minutes a day, whatever. But setting goals like this for 30 days really makes a change. So you need to give it a try for at least 30 days. These are some of the resources and there's the reflective practice. You'll be uh, doing the 10 slides that I mentioned before with Novio, or you can do it with Canva and you like. And uh, the pause, the pause uh, is great for the classroom. Just to pause. Okay, we're going to pause and we're not gonna talk, we're just gonna be quiet and then you can time it. Let's pause and 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 just be still 
and you can do it at different age groups. This could be with adults as well. Uh, for a minute, and then you time it with a bell or something so that they know there's a beginning and an end. You'll also come up with uh, activities. There is a Google Doc with activities that um, there are some activities there that you can use or reuse, make some changes and so on. All right, so we're back in class. Are there any questions? Or comments or anything? There was a question in the chat. Yes. About is how your students are and uh, the age of your students, the students that you mentioned in your classroom. My, my personal classroom? Well, yes, yeah. um, my, my students, my, the kids are from the age of 12, high school and adults. I teach at a mm -hmm. college and I also teach in a junior high and a high school is connected. That's been mm -hmm. my experience. I started with mindfulness with high school kids. I think I mentioned that before. Mm -hmm. And there were comments in the chat. Bob teaches adults, Glenda young, young adults. Puja, less privileged, youth online, Glenda online. You mean fully online? Yes, fully online. Who's that? Uh, that's really. Okay. Yes. Fully mm -hmm. online is tricky because you need them. Um, you know, you want to encourage them to um, to do the tasks. In other words, if you do you have a Zoom meetings or live meetings as well or just as yes. Okay. No, everything is synchronous. So everything is just synchronous? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's hard. That's what I was talking about with Sanya during COVID. It's so difficult to teach uh, online synchronously. So you would uh, encourage, and they're young adults, right? Yes. High school, age, ages? Age. No, they are, uh, well, they have started university. Most oh, okay. of them are freshmen, 18, Wonderful. 17, and okay. when all their adults to 23 and... Yeah, so. Okay, so so they're motivated, right? They want to learn English. That's the idea, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would encourage them to stand up and uh, do various things and even show their, you know, uh, you're using, are you using Zoom? In one of the universities, yes. In the other one is Blackboard. Blackboard doesn't oh, allow oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> BB Collaborate. Mm -hmm. yeah, it used to be mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, they changed it. It belonged to somebody else first and they bought it and made the change. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I would encourage them to stand up and, and to um, open their cameras and maybe talk about things and discuss it and follow it a diary, a journal, try to encourage them to also use their apps. I think that would work with online to use the phone. We can discuss that uh, in the support forms, different tracking systems okay. that would help them. But I would definitely have a pause too. You know, people are afraid of having silence in a, in a synchronous online class, such as this one, but silence is wonderful. You know, even in yeah. any class, online mm -hmm. or face-to-face, -face, just, Okay, we're going to have a moment of silence. And then you wonder if they're going to go anywhere or not. You know, if you do it short for one minute or even have counting, you know, let's count. Uh, and then you can hear their voices maybe. You know, think of creative ways of doing it so that that they're there with you uh, for that pause online. Yeah, I would like to use the recordings, uh, the ones you've, you've been doing with us uh, by John Cabot. So maybe, yeah, know. yeah. There are lots of record. They can also come with suggestions. You can have a Padlet and you know, or other uh, Wakelet. Or, I don't like Wakelet as much, but Padlet where they can add different videos that they've used. Mm -hmm. You know, have an assignment. Okay, find a short video. You know, of mindfulness. <laughs> lots of videos out there on YouTube, and let's and share it on a Padlet, and then they could discuss that. And I think that just the fact that they're looking for, um, you know, mindfulness practice on a video of mindfulness practice, that they would probably pay attention. They would listen to it or, you know, and then you can ask them questions about it or they can write. How was it? Did they speak? Was it a body? What kind of 
mindfulness practice was it so you could you could turn mindfulness into a topic in in a in yeah. a language class that's what i did that's, that's my plan that's my plan yeah and, and turn it. it into instructions you know let's follow it you're mm -hmm. learning to follow instructions okay so sit and then you walk them through it with your voice yeah. and then have them do one on their own where they can practice speaking and using language as you know as practitioner as you know mindfulness teachers mm. Mm, yeah, that's I see. True. Get them involved. All of them. Yeah. Uh huh. That's a key word. Get them involved. Any anyone mm. else have any questions or comments? Maybe you want to add something uh, as well to um, Glenda. Feel free. Yeah, Bob says he's online only to. <gasps> really? Maybe. Where is this fully online? In Poland, you have to be fully online. Is there a problem there, or? It's just an online school, Bob. I don't know if you can use your mic. Uh, he teaches privately. Ah, I see. Okay, if it's and privately, yeah, I can understand mm -hmm. that. Then you can do different things. Of course, you can turn, um, you know, you talk about different topics. Why not talk about, you know, you talk about life skills and, and life in general. And yes, they would really appreciate um your knowledge and you have a lot of it bob because i know you've been practicing so you know about it this this could be a great topic to get them involved as i mentioned to glenda anyone else have any questions and bob yes. suggests a lesson on mindfulness yes that's exactly idea. yes mm -hmm. exactly exactly yeah yeah that's it because you know what's great about what i enjoy about you know teaching english one of the things is the communication and the topics you know, you don't have to go buy the book, which I never have. Um, you, you can choose any topic. And now with, with you know, with the internet these past uh, 30 years, everything's out there. You don't have to, um, you know, do things from the book, so to speak. So yes, mindfulness is a great topic. Maria, do you do... Um, Anything like this in the classroom? Hello, hi. Can you hear me? Hi, yes. Okay, great. Um, Maria? I was just thinking. Is that Maria? Yeah. Can you... yeah. Hello. Because Maria does um, yoga. I can hear you out of the classroom. You can hear me. But yes. Oh, now we hear you. Talk. Oh, great, great. Here, yes. Yes, yes I, you know, I was thinking when you uh, talked about um, concentrating and concentrating and uh, like summoning mind, body, and breath, and maybe spirit together uh, here and now. Uh, well, that's yoga, actually. Yoga means union. So it's the, the mind, the body, and the spirit all uh, gathered and uh, present here and now. And you said, you also said, well, if your mind is somewhere else while your body is doing a certain thing, you might uh, get hurt. And that's totally it. And that's what I tell my, uh, my students in my yoga. Uh, Maria, can you hear me? separate ways uh, you might get hurt if it, I mean, in class that's in a way easier to achieve because um, it's um, you focus on the practice so it's easier to have your mind where your body is and uh, the the practice is so uh, demanding on the body but in the good way that you cannot I mean you forget about everything else so that's why it's uh, therapeutic as well because uh, my my teacher uh, taught me that uh, meditation is uh, placing your mind on a single thing. Exactly. So that, that is to meditate. That's why maybe um, uh, craftsmanship or um, I don't know knitting or doing some artistic activity is so relaxing and therapeutic because your mind is only there. Uh, focused on what you're doing 
So, and I, I was listening to uh, this um, guided uh, mindfulness practice, and it all the time reminded me of <laughs> um, the exercises you do uh, when you're breathing with the pranayama. Well, that's exactly what uh, you have to do. And concentration is the uh, first stage uh, before getting to uh, higher places, mentally speaking, um, before getting to Nirvana or Dhyana, uh, those um, higher places the mind can go. So concentration is the first step, then um, contemplation is the second one, and then where your mind identifies totally with the object you are focusing on so first yeah, that's of all formal when... that's the formal mindfulness yeah. but it you yeah. know the um yoga is um has mindfulness in it you have to have mindfulness while you're using yoga but we're talking about everyday life and you you mentioned that it's hard that's right yoga your heart beats really fast it's almost like it's aerobic uh, in nature, it's it's hard work. Even though you th people watch it and they think, oh, they're just moving their body. No, it's 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 very vigorous. But the thing is that we're taught mindfulness is for everyday activities, uh, and the practice is strengthened by doing whether you're doing yoga that could help you with being mindful mindful throughout the day or whether you're doing formal mindfulness because actually yoga and formal mindfulness are very connected because they're both meditation one is meditation through action and one is meditating through the sitting so um absolutely they but both... the great thing about yes yoga and mindfulness is that then you uh transfer it to your daily life so, for instance, mm -hmm. you have just said to us that to practice uh, mindfulness, you don't need to be alone Full. sitting. You don't yeah. need to prepare the scenario um, thoroughly. You can do it while you're walking, while you're in the middle of the matting crowd. So <laughs> the same goes yoga, that um, mental part of the yoga and uh, also the the body part because it, even if you're sitting or standing waiting for a bus or whatever um, the process is goes on inside us so yoga and mindfulness yes uh, they they're formal mindfulness we're talking about formal mindfulness because both of them are meditation only one is hard work on the body and the other one is um, just sitting so there's no there's no movement it's you have to be still and the idea of being still is also part of yoga because in yoga you do poses and you stay still but here you're just sitting uh still even though there is the yoga uh sitting as well right uh which is but nice. they are interconnected yeah of course of course and they all come from the same same place they all originated in india mindfulness also originated in india over 2000 years ago so actually mindfulness came from india uh, to the west and yoga of course is from india too uh, in the uh, mid 1970s that's a little history with john gabbardson he brought it over and he was a yoga uh, practitioner he still practices yoga so i'd like to thank Welcome. everyone um for today sorry um maria um we don't want to go over the hour if you could continue this in the support form feel free to raise a question or something a comment on what you heard or a clarification or anything in the support support is not just to you know <laughs> to ask questions because you need something it could be just a comment and maybe we'll discuss tracking you know, to find ways of tracking uh, through the phone, because I think that's the best way to track our progress. I, I just would like to share that I'm very grateful for this uh, mindfulness course, and especially the activity by Dr. 
fog which is about um, tiny habit because it has literally had a major impact on my life and literally i have ordered the book and i've also um, put in the link if anyone also wants the book uh, it's it's a workbook and his um, profile is amazing the website the step number 1 to 5 is really worth working on so this has literally changed my life and i literally took like one week to reflect on it so i'm very wonderful, grateful wonderful wonderful yeah fog also changed my one of my daughter's lives and it also changed mine i also uh, i read fog and i followed it and i also changed some habits yeah fog is uh, and he's been researching um change changing habits for many many years so he's really an expert thank you glenda oh i can see that something's happening there but it's beautiful nonetheless <laughs> it's beautiful you know yes it's, everything you said resonates with, yes with it's beautiful and and that's the thing you can look at things that you think you may have thought ooh that's terrible but then you see the beauty because you're not afraid of looking at it and you're looking at it with as John Gabbinson fresh eyes and that's what we're after um increasing our fresh eyes so think about everything that you look at with fresh eyes and mindfulness thank you everyone looking forward to more of your posts i'm really enjoying them and i hope you're in, reading each others as well thank you thank you nelly goodbye everyone thank you